here we are in the final section of First Peter. This will be our, our 12th um, venture into this letter together. So this is the, the finale of First Peter. And we trust that these um, Bible studies have been a blessing to you throughout this time, this unusual time when we've been unable to gather together. And what we've sought to do as a church leadership is both provide ministry of the Word um, twice a week and through Facebook giving us prayer points every day. We've, we've emphasized both the Word and prayer. And like I said, we, we trust that these studies in First Peter have proved beneficial to you. And I trust just as um, Peter did in writing his letter here, that it's exhorted you, it's built you up, encouraged you. So let me read this final section from First Peter, and then we're going to ask God to help us as we look at these final three verses together. So let me first of all read them to you. By Sylvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. And so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Let's begin then in the proper place by approaching the throne of grace and asking God to, to help us, to speak to us through His Word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise You and we bless You. We recognize, as we thought last week, that You are the sovereign God, that You are full of grace and that Your work in our lives results in peace which redounds to Your glory. So, Father, this evening, as we would spend our time looking into Your Word together, Father, be pleased to speak to us once more, to encourage us, to unpack for us more of what Your Son has accomplished and what You long to see accomplished in our lives and in the church which bears the name of Your beloved Son. So, Father, overcome our weaknesses and our frailty and unveil to us more and more of the glorious nature of your grace. In Christ we ask. Amen. Peter began this letter with a prayer, and what he prayed for was, it's found in verse 2, at the end of verse 2 of chapter 1, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. And as he began with a prayer with these two, grace and peace, longing that they would be multiplied to us, again we find him picking up and speaking on both grace in verse 12 of chapter 5 and closing with peace to all of you who are in Christ. In this final section, he's ending where he began speaking of grace and peace. So the subject of these three closing verses uh, is that grace and peace, both in word and in lived example? The, the purpose of this life is made absolute. Purpose of this letter, rather, is made absolutely clear for us when Peter says in verse twelve, "By Sylvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you." Now, when you think about the fact that First Peter is about four times shorter than Romans or Corinthians or the like, this is a rather brief letter indeed. But he says, I have written briefly to you to exhort you, to, to build you up, to encourage you, and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Well, what a gripping phrase. He's saying, well, what I've written to you, this is the true grace of God. Now, I was thinking this past week and earlier on today that if, if someone was introducing the, the queen of our country, they would say, well, this is the queen. The only time they would say this is the true queen is if in actual fact there was 
a, a counterfeit or somebody claiming to be what she actually is or who she actually is. And what Peter is making clear for us here by saying, what I've done to you in this letter is declaring that this is the true grace of God. What Peter is reminding us of is there is such a thing as false grace of God. You see, many people have been rescued by the grace of God from a joyless, sterile, legalistic religion. And one of the beautiful things things that grace does is it liberates us, it sets us free. It it removes the, the heavy burdens from off of our shoulders. And what Peter has been unveiling in this letter for us to see is that the grace of God has been made manifest in the person of Jesus Christ. What he's told us about Jesus Christ is that he is chosen and precious. That's what we have in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, speaking about Jesus. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. He goes on to explain for us, like into chapter 3 and verse 18, that through his suffering upon the cross, he has achieved victory over sin, our redemption. So in chapter 3 and verse 18, he says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. What we're told later on in verse 22 is, having done everything to satisfy the righteous requirements of God and suffering for us upon the cross, he is now exalted to the right hand of God. So we read this, speaking of Jesus again, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to him. So all the demands of God's justice have been met by Christ, the the grace of God who has been made manifest. And what we know, again, according to to Peter here, is that it's through the blood of Christ. This is 1 Peter 1, verse 18. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. So, so Christ has done everything. And what we do is we, we approach him in faith, believing he has done everything necessary to satisfy the righteous requirements of God, knowing that as we approach him in faith, grace is gifted to us. So our sins have been dealt with and the blessings of God have been opened up to us through Christ. Now, this is where false grace can sometimes be proclaimed even within and around the church. And it suggests something like this. Since Christ has done everything for us, and we receive his benefits through grace, which is freely gifted to us, therefore there's nothing for us to do. Live as you please, free from the law with all its requirements that it weighed upon you, and satisfy any desire that you have. You're free. This is grace. Do as you please. Now, that attitude and that sentiment, whilst it may claim to be the grace of God, it's not the true grace of God, which Peter has been unveiling for us in this letter. If you are saying, because the grace of God has reached to me, then I will sin and do as I please, you've never really understood grace. You've probably never received grace the true grace of God. This tour of true grace that Peter has taken us on through his letter, it's like a fine dance of, as the scholars would say, the indicatives and the imperatives. 
The, the indicative saying, this is what Christ has done, and the imperative saying, therefore, this is how we respond, this is what we do. And what you find in First Peter is both the indicatives and the imperatives almost involved in, like I said, a dance together. So we're hearing about what Christ has done, and then Peter's saying, therefore, this is what we do. So there's the indicatives which speak of Christ and the imperatives which tell us, therefore, this then is how we should live. So let me give you some examples. It's hinted at in verse 2. Well, hints probably an understatement where it says, for obedience to Jesus Christ. It's like Peter saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unpack for you what obedience to Jesus Christ is actually like. And this is part of the true grace of of God. In verse 13, he, he calls us, commands us, prepare your minds for action, being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you. So, he's, he's calling upon us to, to have our minds ready. From verse 14 to verse 18, he speaks like this, as obedient children. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also are to be holy. And there's this call to, to holiness. In verse 22, there's this, this command to love one another earnestly. It's not a suggestion, it's actually a command. In chapter 2, in verse 1, he says, put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy. He says, get rid of those things. In verses 11 and 12 of that chapter, he says this, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good works and glorify God on the day of visitation. So he's saying, these are the things I want you to be doing. He goes on to command us to be subject to the various structures around about us that God and His providence has wrapped around us. He, he tells us to, to be humble, to be good stewards, to be self-controlled, to be hospitable, and on and on and on, the list of imperatives, commands, side by side, with the good news of Jesus Christ telling us what God has done for us, and the imperatives, the commands, instructing us on what obedience to Jesus Christ actually looks like. So if we are to excel in following after Jesus Christ, then we need both of these. We need to be growing more and more in our understanding of what God in Christ has done for us as the grace of God is made manifest for us in the gospel, in the person of Jesus Christ. And equally in our living, the imperatives which are attached to this we're living them out, and this is the true grace of God. And what Peter is telling us here is, stand firm in it. He said, I've written to you about the true grace of God. Now, stand firm in it. One of the, the best ways of learning is not simply reading, but seeing examples laid bare, as it were, before your very eyes. Initially, I think, we miss the three examples that are set before our very eyes in the last three verses of 1 Peter. And the reason I think we, we miss it is we, we assume, well, everything that Peter wanted to say has been done now, and this is just a polite way to, to finish off the letter. And equally, it's that notion of, well, what are we, what are we going to do next? This is the finale for us in First Peter as we've been sharing in these studies together. And when we get to the last three verses, the temptation can be, okay, well, what's coming next? What, what book or subject are we going to study next? And it's almost like our minds have moved on as though the first, last three verses are kind of kind of irrelevant. And isn't the prayer there in verse 11 anyway, to him be the, be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And I wonder which book we'll study next. And we miss these three examples that are set before our very 
eyes. Three individuals are mentioned in the close of this letter. Uh, First of all, Silvanus, who Peter regards as a faithful brother. And then, of course, there's, there's Peter here who's, you know, I regard him, I have written briefly. So, Peter's involved in this. And then there's Mark, whom Peter refers to as my son. So, let's consider them just kind of one at a time in in no particular order. I'm going to begin with with Mark and think about him as an example for us of the true grace of God working out in someone's life. To, To lead into this, however, what I want you to to think about and maybe to answer, honestly, do you believe God can use you for the furtherance of His purposes in His kingdom? When you think about the life that you've lived, the way that you've lived this past week, maybe today, Do you believe God is is willing and can use you for the furtherance of His kingdom? If your confidence is resting on your own works and your own achievements and your observance of the law, as in the things that you do, then setting aside all hypocrisy the honest way to answer that question is, no. I don't believe God could use me based on, on my works and my, my law-keeping, as it were, my doing the right thing. Because what we are painfully aware of is how often we fall short. How often the standards of God are here and we fall way below them. Oh, other people might not know or see but we do. And based on our works and and our our obedience, as it were, there's that notion of, I don't think God would ever dare use me. Perhaps what you do again and again is you replay ways that you have sinned in the past, and they haunt you even now. If only I hadn't made that choice, then perhaps my life would have proved so much more productive for God. If only I hadn't sinned in this way, then who knows what God may have done with my life. But we can't change the past, and we are where we are. Sometimes perhaps we think that we, we're going to be the number of those who are saved as though by the skin of our teeth, and that will be enough. I remember sitting with a a friend of mine in a a little chef restaurant on the side of the A14 on the way to Ipswich, so it's in in Suffolk, little restaurant, side of the A14, and my friend had tears running down his face. And he'd he'd fallen, he'd sinned, And everybody knew about it. His ministry was over. And his question, with with all the remorse and the regret that he had, was an honest one, a simple one. Is my usefulness for Christ over? I've, I've fallen. I've let everyone down. I've brought shame and reproach upon the name of Christ. Is my usefulness to Christ over? See, in verse 13, the church in Rome sends greetings to the dispersed believers. Now, now what an encouraging start to that verse. The, The advance of Christ has been so successful that there's now a group of chosen ones, the elect, the church, in Rome itself, in Babylon as it's described. The advance of the the 
cause of Christ has reached into Rome and there is a church there. I mean, imagine if, if you were to get a letter from the, the church that meets in North Korea and it just wanted to send you greetings. I mean, here's, here's the church in Rome and this verse starts off by just, you know, th- this is great, but it's the way it finishes which is truly just delightful when it comes to understanding the nature of true grace. And it's not just the church in Rome that sends you greetings. And so does Mark, my son. It it seems that Mark must have been converted through the ministry of the apostle Peter. Uh, And Mark is one of these ones that, you know, if 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 he was in or around the church when you were there, you'd be looking at him thinking he's just, he's so full of potential. And he seems to have the the giftings and the circumstances uh, and everything seems to be going right. He's growing in grace and in the knowledge of Christ. He's he's knowing more and more about Jesus. The, The imperatives are getting answered in his life as he's walking in um, following after Christ, being obedient, loving Jesus, loving others, and people around him are beginning to notice his abilities, his giftings, some of the the high hegians, we would call them, the, the big hitters in the church are beginning to pull him into ministry, and he's hanging out with the likes of Paul and Barnabas, and his cousin, you know, and it's just Everything seems to be going well for him. Until, that is, they hit Pamphylia. And at that point, Mark falls. And the effects of his fall are huge. In the early church, in fact, forget that, in the history of the church, There is one tag team that I don't think has ever been surpassed. Paul Barnabas. These guys, their their ministry and the way they complement one another, stunning. And they're going around planting churches, building churches, establishing churches, um, building people up, making elders. You know, it's just their work was stunning. And because of Mark, or on account of Mark, the greatest tag team in the history of the church is blown apart. It seems that what happened was, before they got to Pamphylia, there was um, Paul and Barnabas and and a group of disciples around about them, including Mark. And Paul is busy sharing the gospel, and the mob respond by attempting to kill Paul. They try and stone him to death. And it seems that Mark witnessed this. And they assumed that the mob had managed it, and they thought that Paul was actually dead. So the disciples gather around him, but he actually gets up, and I imagine he's pretty battered and bruised. I mean, if somebody throws one stone at us, we're probably, you know, aching for like a week. Here, Paul has been, they've attempted to stone him to death. He's going to be a mess. And they thought he was dead. And Mark's one of the ones who gathers around him, builds him up, and they they move on to Pamphylia. And it's there that you you get this idea that Mark's like, "I'm, I'm not up for this. I didn't sign up for this. And he's spoken of in Acts 15 as withdrawing, as stepping back. And everybody knew. He he failed. He was more interested in in his self than the kingdom of Christ. He wanted it to be more about him than it was actually to be about Jesus. He walked away from ministry. He withdrew. And as far as the Apostle Paul was concerned, he's finished. It's over. It's it's done. Barnabas, though, thought otherwise. See, see Barnabas, his, his name is just, he's a son of encouragement. And he's looking at Mark in the midst of his failure. And Barnabas's thought is, no, God is not finished with him. Sin does not get to have the final say. Yes, he's fallen and he's failed. 
But I want to exhort him. I want to build him up. One of the same reasons that Peter is writing this letter to the dispersed to exhort them in the true grace of God. And who is it in here who as well as the church in Rome that sends greetings to all the dispersed? Who's the other person that's mentioned by Peter? Mark, my son, he also sends you greetings. Do you know who eventually describes Mark as a fellow worker in the gospel? At the end of Philemon, it's Paul. Paul who'd written him off and said, no, it's, it's, it's over. Paul describes him as a fellow worker in the gospel. And in Paul's final letter that he wrote, which is 2 Timothy, where he's, he's in Rome, he's awaiting execution, he's awaiting being put to death. And he says this, so much suffering on so many different levels. This is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Now listen to what he says next. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Mark failed and fell. But the true grace of God has the power to lift up the fallen and refuses to allow our past and our failure and our sin to dictate what God can do with us in the present and what He is preparing for our future. You may have fallen, but the true grace of God means God's not finished with you. And he can still use you for his purposes and the furtherance of his son's kingdom. I mean, think about it. The most obvious thing of all, who wrote 1 Peter? And I believe it's pretty obvious. It was the apostle Peter, the disciple of Christ named Cephas or Peter. How many times did he blow it. Uh, How many times did he not just get a little bit wrong, but completely wrong? He's the one who gets rebuked by Jesus and actually called Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Because Peter is actually trying at that point to thwart the redemptive plan of God Almighty that has been planned throughout the ages, and Peter himself is trying to stop it because he doesn't fully understand what is going on. It's Peter who's arguing with the other disciples for supremacy, to be the greatest of them all. And it's Peter, remember, who denies Christ not once, but on three occasions. Now, many people I've heard uh, as I was um, had to come to faith and I was growing in my knowledge of this, they, they would say, yeah, but when, when Pentecost happened, Peter is flooded with the Spirit and he's like transformed. He's no longer affected by fear, but the Spirit in him has just done a work and you're presented with the complete package after Pentecost. All of Peter's mistakes were before he was filled with the Spirit, but now that he's filled with the Spirit, he's like a changed person. Now, that's an interesting sounding theory, but all that it actually proves is the people saying that have clearly never read the book of Galatians, because Galatians is post-Pentecost, when Peter is filled with the Spirit, and Paul says, you know, Peter turns up, and I have to oppose Peter to his face. Because Peter, who's the apostle to the Jews, separates himself, and he's only hanging out with the Jews, and he's encouraging people to distort the whole gospel. So I have to encourage, I have to rebuke Peter in front of everybody, 
because through fear, he's distorting the gospel. You see, Peter's story is he's someone who gets it wrong again and again and again. And yet the true grace of God, in spite of all his failures, is able to use someone like Peter. One of the ways that we see this so clearly, that's so encouraging to us, is the way he speaks about Silvanus. And this is where you see a transformation in Peter that I just wish we in the church could imitate what we are seeing in these three verses. Listen to how he speaks about Silvanus, verse 12. He's, he's, what he's saying is Silvanus is going to deliver these letters, or this letter. He says, about Silvanus, I regard him as a faithful brother. I, I don't know if you, you knew this, but if you don't, you've just never opened your eyes and looked around you. In and around churches, we have a tendency to be extremely tribal, as in there's there's our tribe here, and then there's that tribe. And the history, particularly of the church in Scotland, but I would argue probably throughout the Western world, is one of tribalism. When Barnabas took Mark and went on mission with him, when Paul was totally against the idea, Paul replaced Barnabas with a guy that's affectionately known as Silas. Now, it's the same person, Silvanus Silas. It's, it's the same guy. So, Silvanus is a, a, an associate, an apprentice of Paul, who is the apostle to the Gentiles. And who you've got writing the letter here is Peter, who's the apostle to the Jews, now, if this was left to us with our history in Scotland, we would have a tribal divide right here. On, on the one hand, you've got Paul, who's got a ministry to the Gentiles. On the other hand, in this other tribe, you have Peter, who's got a ministry to the Jews. Paul has taken to his side Silvanus, so he's with Paul. And Peter over here, let's not forget, Paul publicly rebuked Peter telling him off in front of everybody, saying you're distorting the gospel. Now, if that had happened in Scotland, we would have what we affectionately know as a church split. There'd be Peter's tribe and Paul's tribe. And anybody associated with each one, well, you don't cross-pollinate. But what you find here is Peter speaking about Silvanus, who's a disciple of Paul, he says, I regard him as a faithful brother. This is what the true grace of God looks like, where there is genuine affection and affirming going across what would other be tribal divisions. I find verse 14 of 1 Peter chapter 5 one of the most troubling verses in the entire New Testament because of my makeup. Greet one another with the kiss of love. That verse makes me incredibly uncomfortable. Uh, many people have suffered during this time of um, social isolation, where you can't embrace and hug other people. Some of us, th this is like, well, this is okay. I like my own space, like some of you do. Um, I, I don't mind not being hugged a, a lot by um, people in church or, or whatever. Verse 14, it's saying, greet one another with a kiss of love. Maybe, just maybe, if in the highlands of Scotland or in Scotland, we actually practice verse 14, 
maybe our history as a church would be completely different. At the very least, what Peter is saying is, between Christians, there ought to be an affection, a love. We're actually called in this letter to love one another earnestly. Not just those believers who we regard as being within our tribe. Peter speaks about Silvanus, who's linked with Paul. And he says, I regard him. He's a faithful brother. In actual fact, this letter is entrusted with his, to him to take around the churches. And Peter is saying this, he's saying, I trust this man so much that he's going to be able to unpack some of the meaning in here for you. And if you have any questions, you can be asking him as he's reading the letter to you. I mean, talk about affirming other believers. Maybe if we could do more of this, then apparently the church, seeing our love for one another, will believe that we're followers of Jesus Christ. Because let's face it, on the face of the earth, there are only two tribes. Just two. There are those who are in Christ, by faith, and are experiencing the true grace of God. And there are those who are outside of Christ. And that's it. In Christ, outside of Christ. Those are the only two tribes on the face of this planet. And the difference is not skin color or race or, or language or gender. The difference is saving faith on the one hand and no saving faith on the other. Because what he says here is, to all of you who are in Christ, there's the tribe of saving faith in Christ. To all of you who are in Christ, peace. Now, here's an interesting thing to take from this. The source of all of our blessings as followers of Christ is the true grace of God. The source of our blessings, the true grace of God. The effect of the true grace of God is peace. Peace with God, peace within, when I realize Christ has done everything, and peace with brothers and sisters who are in Christ, firming them and building them up and expressing love toward them, just as Peter has shown us toward Silvanus. Peace in the gospel, as I look at Mark and think he fell, but God still used him. As a fellow worker in the gospel of Peter and, and Paul, to, to write a gospel. So my past and my sin don't get to determine how God can use me in the present. That's rooted in the grace of God. And what it leaves guarding my mind and my heart is the peace of God itself. I hope and I pray these studies in this letter have proved fruitful, and my prayer is that the grace and peace of God would be multiplied to you. Let me pray for us, and then I'll introduce our, our video. Let's pray. Father, so many of your children suffer at the hands of the evil one. So often we suffer at our own hands as we weigh ourselves in the scales of religion and law and commandment keeping. And all the while, your grace longs to see us set free. Father, for any of us, your children, who've been weighed down with the lies of the evil one, that we've blown it, that it's finished, it's over, that our usefulness is gone. 
that we may just be saved, that we might scrape in to everlasting life. Father, may the darkness of such thoughts be expelled by the light of the glory of your Son, that the gospel may afresh wash over our hearts and our minds, keeping us and guarding us in the true knowledge of him who is full of grace and truth. Father, may we be men and women who are standing firm in true grace. Keep us from all lies and falsehood. May our life show off obedience to our Savior and our Redeemer and our Lord. And may knowledge of Him allow your peace to settle upon our minds and keep our hearts guarded. Father, hear these prayers we ask, and may you create within us a heart of encouragement, like the one within Peter as he wrote this letter, like that within Barnabas as he he sought to build up and encourage Mark. May we become encouragers to one another. Hear our prayer. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. The final hymn that we're going to sing together is one that is very, 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 very well known to us all. And we'll, um, the video will be up here and the link will be in the description box. Thank you. <laughs>